All right, uh, so this is James Clay from Bib World. We're here at Winslow BMW. This is the Monday after our hill climb. Uh, car's already headed back home, but uh, we're hanging out here. I'm with Rich Grupp, who is our fabricator, builder, the main guy uh, that made the car come to life, and Wayne Yawn, uh, engineer, designer, um, you know, the, the ideas behind the car. But, you know, I, I think, uh, I think this build was really a, a collaboration, um, and you know, to say that you know, there's so much merging of, of abilities uh, between these two guys that you know that made this whole thing happen. So um, anyway, uh, we you guys have sent us some questions. We're gonna we're gonna answer some of those, um, and we'll we'll go over the car uh, in the future more in detail. But uh, for now, we'll we'll jump into your questions. So we, for, to lead off, we have a few questions, and these are these are ones that we've covered in uh, in our in our Facebook, uh, YouTube videos, etc. But we'll go ahead and just hit some of the basics again, because obviously so many people have asked the questions again that uh, it's it's worth repeating. So the car is an E36 uh, or so. It's a 1996 BMW M3. It has a P63 motor. It's a built version of that motor, so big forged internals, a more airflow, bigger turbos. Uh, to make the to make the level of power that we've made, it, to, the the level of power is 1,100 uh, or so. Although we had to we had to strap it down on the dyno and the wheels were still spinning, so we, it's it's probably above that 1,100 number. And then we know at the mountain we actually turned the boost up a little bit, so we're we're estimating somewhere around 1,200 at the wheels. So whatever that is at the crank, it's it approaches 1,500, but the it, it's just as much power as we want to to throw at it. How much does it weigh? 2850 or so. It got a little bit heavier as we started to add things specific to the hill climb. Uh, we're going to go back and think about how to make it a little bit lighter, of course. Uh, as, as we do, we, we, we go through iterations, improve. Um, so it'll, it'll be quicker for next year. And then uh, how fast is it? Well, this, this year we were 640 something to the second third third step of the mountain to devil's playground it's kind of an irrelevant number because it, it was a shortened race you know weird year but how fast is it in the sense of how fast will it go in a straight line it's geared for over 200 uh, certainly we we assume it will get there it's got a lot of heavy aero but it's got a lot of power to pull that and probably be dragging the ground by the time it got to 200 miles an hour uh, in current configuration but again configuration is going to adjust So why did we build this car? Um, these these guys are a bad influence. That's that, that's my that's my primary reason for building this car. I, you know, we we went to Pikes Peak in 2017 and did well, but wanted to do more. So we knew that that meant turbos, and it meant big aero, and an E36 is the is the chassis that I started with as Bimmer World and and kind of love. But then I got Wayne involved, and, and he got Rich involved, and so you know, tell us about the aero package. What you know? What, how did that evolve? So Wayne Yon and I used to work at Jim Downing's, and we worked on GTP cars, which are heavy aero cars. So my shop, we still have a lot of the molds for some of the ground effects tunnels and whatnot. So Wayne brought the car to our shop to do the tunnel work. Um, and then that led into uh, a huge amount of creep <laughs> <laughs> because then we needed more power and the six cylinder wasn't going to get it so we put the V8 in which meant a bigger chassis uh, to hold the power and to fit everything um, so we, we took some old GTP tunnels and actually made them even bigger uh, then we worked on one set of wings and we decided we needed bigger wings, uh, more splitter out in the front. Uh, the front was developed from previous Lola uh, LMP cars um, and it just, it just got crazy from there. What, what moment was it that, that made us think that, that the build was worth it? I mean, Honestly, I think it's, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever questioned whether it was worth it. It's, it's something, 
I'll never, I'll never do something like this at this level again, I, I don't think. This thing was a one-year project, grew into a two, three-plus-year project. And, I mean, through the whole thing, the, the, you know, it's, we had scope creep, like Rich talked about, but, um, you know, just to see the, the level of build and fabrication and design and, you know, it's been tremendously enjoyable the whole time. I mean, what what made it worth it to you guys? Because you you guys are doing all the hours. The you know we've we've we tried several times to get this thing ready to go out and run in twenty hour days and weeks of them at a time. So what makes it worth it? So I don't I don't know if this exactly answers the question, but every everything I've ever done in racing, there's a pretty tight box of rules, and. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I went to Rich with this project was because uh, we sit around all the time and dream about, you know, what you would do, how, tunnels or where the wing would be and, you know, how you would design a car. And very often, you, there's no place to run a car, your dream car, because everything has a very tight um, set of rules. And so I knew Rich would be excited about building a car with with tunnels as big as we can fit and with a splitter as, you know, as whatever we can dream up splitter wise and horsepower wise and fitting giant radiators in the front of it and just, just all the stuff we had to deal with, dream about and put into this car and that, that's what makes it worth it. And the other thing is, is current racing, the homologation and the rules, you can't barely even drill a hole in a car without being illegal. Yep. Here we've got like an open sheet. It's like old time racing where you dream it, you build it, and you go run it. And I guess the biggest thing is, is trying, you know, once we saw the arrow and it seems like it's working, we always were hearing horsepower numbers and it was like, well, those are pretty big. and. And then once you finally see those numbers, it's like, well, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> you know, everybody's throwing numbers out. And it's like, yeah, okay, great. But you actually see it, and now it's on the mountain. Yeah, we have a little more work to get it all working together. But it's pretty darn cool. All right, so what, what prompted the big arrow? So. <laughs> You know, we, we've had this we've had this build sheet going for, for since the project started because you know that's how you build a car. You start with all the things that you're going to do, and, and it's all laid out, organized. Unfortunately, ours also got reorganized, added to, reorganized, added to, etc. So the the big reason for the for the arrow, well, in, in my in my eyes, um, we knew we knew that the pike surface has gotten brutal. The, the bumps have gotten crazy big. They're, they're building this visitor center on top, have been for as long as we've been building our car. And they haven't, uh, they, they haven't had the money to, to resurface the road. The, all the money's gone to building that visitor center. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we've, we've got heavy truck and equipment running up and down and just destroying the road. Of course, all the freeze thaws and so forth. But, but that kind of road with all the bumps means that you can't run this car how we would ideally want to. I think if we were running this thing on a racetrack, we'd suck it right down to the ground and we'd put it on packers and into the bump stops. So basically almost take the spring out of the equation and that just won't run up this road. So, you know, I've been nudging um, a little bit like, hey, we, let's let's make it look wilder. Let's get, let's get bigger arrow, bigger arrow. And then I, I think Rich and Wayne said, okay, you want bigger arrow? Here you go, and so, so I was. I kept kind of waiting for for that, and uh, and then these guys decided to go nuts with it. So you know, I don't know where that. I don't even know where that came from. Yeah, I think the big thing about this race is, unlike a road course, we need arrow to come in at 30, 40 miles an hour, and so we were doing everything to try and to make that happen. So we put the big end fences and expense extended the splitter out and, and all that. So is it ideal for, you know, Silverstone? No. But for Pikes Peak, we want Arrow coming in as soon as we can get it. How much time did I spend at Wide Open Throttle? So we ran the boost on eight, which is all the way up. That's given us the approximately 1,200 of the tire or so. 
as a driver, I would say, you know, it's like 70% wide open throttle, of course. Um, but then these guys are going to pull the data and tell me <laughs> tell me that I'm wrong. So it's it's wild. Even though we've got traction control in that car and we can really clamp down on on the the tire spin, it, you know, it's the arrow comes in the arrow comes in hard, middle of third gear or something like that. When you when you reach the middle of third gear, you can kind of just go to full throttle and know it's going to stick. Below that. You, you still have to modulate. I could lean into the traction control and just let it sort it out, but I think I think we're still with the with the level of development we've got at this point, still have an advantage to uh, to modulating that throttle. And of course, then there's the whole piece of uh, you know there's there's a section of the track where you're looking at blue sky and you're rolling through there at 120, 130, and you can just keep going and um, something deep inside me tells me that I shouldn't be full throttle for that whole period of time. So, you know, part of it's on me, I'll work on that that bit. Um, the reality of it is a car like this, you, you have to you have to be pointed somewhat straight to be on full throttle and that's probably like thirty percent of the time on this on this kind of track. So what what other events are we gonna do? SCCA uh, was asked and you know other hill climbs, and certainly SCCA has has those. That's for, that's from one of my friends that I met in SCCA, I think. And um, you know, it's really tough to figure out where to run this car. Honestly, it's uh, it's hard to want to do a hill climb. Although certainly we need to sort out uh, some things specific to a hill climb. But there's no hill climb that's like Pikes Peak, and that's why we do it. It's it's you know you start at nine thousand, you go to fourteen thousand. The air is different up there. Um, it's it's just it's hard to duplicate. And I don't love hill climbs in the first place. I, you know, I'd like to run off into a, a nice paved area or, or a gravel trap or something like that when I find the limit of this, this thing, not, uh, not off the mountain into trees, which is you know, a, another part of the excitement of Pike. So we're going to build on this thing, refine it. Uh, we're going to find places to run it. But it's, uh, you know, how, do, how do you run a car that's capable of 200 miles an hour, that's, that's capable of lap times that are you know, 20, 30 seconds under what the typical car is. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of private testing and, and we'll figure this out. But I think as of yesterday, we've, we've already got our list planned for, for next year. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of development work and it's more, maybe more work than more playing and having fun right now. So. How much, how much downforce do we make? Uh, how much did we lose by raising the car? Of course, when we raised the car, we added all the, we added a bigger rear wing, we added the, the crazier front arrow. I mean, my, my number is 5,000 at, you know, at sea level at 150, but, you know, I'm not smart enough to come up with that number, so I, I assume I got it from you guys, or, you know, it's speculation. We haven't been to the tunnel, but, but you know, we've, we've also used, used proven pieces on this car. Of course, gotten bigger with the, the bigger with the tunnels, bigger with the front. You know, what what kind of downforce does it make? How do we how do we sort that out in, in theory before we test it in reality? I think we are probably close four or five thousand pounds at 150. Um, part of that is just the wing data that the wing manufacturer gave us, and where the wings were placed and the front and rear uh, distribution of that. Ideally, we want it on the ground to be in ground effect, but uh, so yeah, we are giving up a little bit, and that's the that's the compromise you have to make to get over the bumps and through the low speed corners and whatnot. So, you know, we might have given up 20, 30 percent raising the car, um, and that's something hopefully we'll verify in the wind tunnel this year. But, but we did we did put a lot of work in to fit those tunnels because a tunnel car is less sensitive to rod height, roll, pitch. And yeah, we could have fit a flat bottom under the car with a lot less work, a flat bottom with a diffuser on the back with a lot less work, but it's a lot more sensitive to rod height, roll, and rate changes. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of work on the tunnels themselves and a lot of work on the car to fit those tunnels. Yeah, we, Wayne mentions the tunnels, and you know I, I know you love the tunnels. I, yeah. you know that was kind of one of the premises the car was built around. 
but you know you, you don't see the tunnels necessarily we've outlined them in the back so from a rear shot you'll you'll see that there's some gaping holes there but you don't really see you know the throat of that thing comes up to the the front of the driver's knees they, they go really far forward you see the big front splitter that we've added you, see, you know of course you see a big rear wing but those tunnels are creating big front downforce and uh, you know where that center of pressure is I'm not exactly sure we've, we've had to adjust that and of course it's dynamic as well as much as the car moves right now which isn't ideal but you know that's 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 part of the sacrifice we made on this thing as we were tuning it trying to get it to work on the bumps we had to come up because we couldn't have it slam on the ground we had to uh, we had to you know just there, there's a there's a fair amount of droop uh, we had to raise the rear of the car. Normally, that would be that'd be good for what front front downforce. Raise, raise the rear of the car with those big tunnels. But you know, a lot of this is a balance of not necessarily what we're doing for the aero grip of the car, but what we have to do for the mountain. Um, how much can we can we raise it to keep it from bottoming? How much can we raise it and, and still not lift the rear tires off the ground? You know, it's a very difficult balancing act, and I don't I don't think what we ran on the mountain would be what we we would ideally want to run somewhere else but you know it's if we had the tools available given those massive tunnels and some of the other work we've done to to create something that worked there also